This is some kind of fighting. It may be one-on-one, -on -one, it may be five-on-one, -on -one, the purpose being to show how brave you are, that you have heart, that you have courage. That's one reason to ask to be initiated, to be jumped in, which is the phrase. But initiations weren't only about getting beat up. It may involve some kind of criminal activity. It may involve going along on certain exploits with gang members in order to show that you've got the stuff. But because violence was so much a part of gang life, initiations sometimes ended tragically. For four days, Chicago police searched for 11-year-old Robert Sandifer. Last night, just after midnight, they found him under a Southside viaduct, shot twice in the head. Police say last Sunday, the sixth grader was firing on rival gang members as part of an initiation rite when he killed 14-year-old Siobhan Dean, an innocent bystander, and wounded two others. With the intense police search, Robert may have become a liability to the very gangs that armed him. Here's a perfect example of someone who apparently you know, was doing the bidding of people in gangs and finds himself then because he is expendable, uh, apparently uh, uh, becoming a victim of the gangs himself. Do you get used to death? Do you get used to living with the fact that you could die any day? Do See, I don't worry about that until you get hit by that bullet. See, like, that's just like when people steal cars. They don't worry about getting caught until they get caught, right? And that's the same when we're shooting at a person. I don't think about getting caught until I get caught. There were some gang members, a few, who reached the point where they wanted to get away from the violence, the danger of gang life. But quitting a gang was easier said than done, as we'll see when the 20th century returns. Since a typical gang member saw no future outside the gang, he was often reluctant to give up life inside the gang. Anyone trying to break away from gang life usually needed help, and a lot of it, from outsiders. David is a former gang member trying to make it on the road back. Away from gangs, away from violence. He's been out on parole for a month. A meeting of the California Youth Authority, an agency that supervises and assists parolees. When you go for an interview, any visible tattoos that will hinder you from getting that position? Yeah. Did you like to get that removed? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna vaporize your tattoo. By shedding the brand that marked him a gang member, David is taking a big step towards a new life. Comfortable, David? Oh, yeah. It takes six weeks to heal completely. But back in his neighborhood, the question was, how long would he be able to stay away from his old gang? It's pretty hard. Sometimes you go through a stress mood, and it's very easy to fall back, because I've been so used to being in the streets, it's like, a lot of times I got the urge, like, just go back. But I want to have my nephews look up to me. I want to be somebody. I want to show them I could do it. And I'm pretty sure I can. If David managed to stay out of gangs permanently, he'd be lucky. That's because programs to get kids out of gangs had largely disappointing results. Hands on top of your head, stand next to your friends. So a lot of cities fell back on law enforcement people, special gang units to discourage gangs and gang membership. When they're not jogging, Sergeant Nick Titoriga and his elite anti-gang team called Crash chase gang members in the 77th. And I'll put my Crash unit against any unit in the city of Los Angeles or against anybody in the United States and we'll whip their ass. See some hands. Put your hands up. Face the building. Don't move. Put your legs out. There you go. This guy over here is wanted for a uh, street robbery. That Nick Titoriga been... has taken his tactics from the streets. Why are you selling marijuana on my streets? I've been around a little bit while. The community's tired of these of these thugs and gangsters out here taking the streets over. Look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. The objective was to make life so unpleasant for gang members that they wanted to give up their guns. The crash unit, we're coming out of the alleys, we're jumping out of roofs, plays by street rules. We're coming at them hard and we're letting them know we ain't tolerating it. With intimidation. Try to do that one more time. See what happens to you. And arrests. You got a lot of money today, man. But police departments with gang units had mixed results. We've watched a lot of suppression programs in Los Angeles in particular, only to see the gang problem growing worse and worse and worse. The more you give attention to the group, the more it sees itself as special. Inadvertently, you're feeding the very factors that have brought about gangs in the first place. I forwarded the applications on all the jobs for you guys. That's why one police sergeant in Hartford, Connecticut, decided to try something different. 
Swing it, swing it, swing it. Police Sergeant Mark Rivera finally got discouraged, so five years ago, he decided to try another approach. Give youngsters a reason to stay out of the gangs. Today, he runs Hartford's Police Athletic League. Come on, Danny. What is it you offer young people if the gang can't? I compete with them. I fight for the hearts and minds of the young people. Danny yeah, is 16. Danny, I know you've been out there smoking some reefer with your friends. And Danny, that, that I can't tolerate. That's really disrespectful towards me. I'm a policeman and I'm supposed to uphold laws. And then when you come in here high, that's just like throwing in my face that he just don't care. He knows the boy is spending time with a gang. He worries the gang will win his loyalty and perhaps his life. You need to be involved in the kid's life. They're not going to remember any rich and famous person who espouses some well-developed philosophy based on brilliant theory. They're going to remember the individual who's there with them every day. We've seen very few gang control programs or intervention programs that work. The community has to be healthy in order to get rid of gangs, and we have an awful lot of unhealthy communities right now. That unhealthy image is what Father Greg Boyle, a Jesuit priest, fought in Los Angeles, the only way he knew how, by providing the unconditional love that most of those young people had never felt. If it wasn't for him, I'd probably been dead by now. Without Father Greg, you'd be dead, you believe? A lot of us would have been dead without him. Really? Why? What, what does he do that... He has a lot of... He's like a second father to lots of us. We got problems, he's always there for us. He never says no to us. We say, we gotta talk to you, G. Like, all right, I'll be there or come down. But he never says, nah, I can't talk to you right now, I'm busy. He ain't like that. To stay out of trouble. To earn gang members respect, Father Boyle followed the gang code of absolute loyalty. He never turned in a gang member for a crime. I, I didn't take my vows to LAPD, you know. You know that some of these kids, I don't say the kids in this room, but you know that gang members have shot, have killed, have sold drugs. You never tell the cops about it. No, but I talk to the kids about it. But I, especially in a case of a, of a murder, which is like uh, obviously very serious. And, I, and I, I, my hope for a kid in a case like that is that he will turn himself in, take responsibility for what he's done. But Father Boyle also gave them something they never had before, the prospect for a decent job, a decent life. William, job. You're not old enough? Beyond a limited number of city jobs available to these homeboys, Father Greg has found few private employers willing to take a chance hiring them. So he's formed construction crews of homeboys to build a parish daycare center. Another crew does maintenance work around the church. All the salaries are paid out of contributions. And Father Greg prays enough checks will come in the mail every Thursday to make his payroll every Friday. So don't make me pay you for the time you didn't work. Beyond jobs, Father Boyle has set up an alternative high school staffed by Jesuits and lay teachers for gang member dropouts. A map often shows north up. So you were thrown out of school, and who got you to go back to school? Huh? Father Greg. I was getting kicked out of schools, and nobody wanted me, you know, so there's the only place I could come. And do you like being here in school? Yeah, because um, I'm learning something. The most important of Father Boyle's many accomplishments is making these kids believe in themselves. He's trying to tell us that there's another person inside of us, that you know, we're not all just gangbangers, that we could become, you know, citizens, regular citizens. Would you like that? I'll be all right. That would be all right? Yeah. The reason I got out of the gang was um, simply I was taught to, to think what I was doing was good. In actuality, it was evil. What made Kelly eventually see gang life as evil was religion. I was able to, to come out of that through the grace of, you know, my higher power or the God of my understanding. So I have to see hope. In fact, hope for the future is what convinced many young people to leave street gangs. But in many neighborhoods, hope was in short supply. So long as we have marginalized ethnic groups, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, whatever they may be, the gang problem will probably grow. And so long as that community remains the way it is or gets worse, gets less, dis less organized, uh, then the gang problem is going to be there and it's going to grow because we're doing nothing 
uh, to prove.